Echoplex Media streams seven days a week on twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. With a variety of hosts and topics, there's bound to be something you'll like or hate so much you can't stop watching it. Check out our full schedule at echoplexmedia.com. I like to think that I'm smart enough to not eat a Tide Pod. Welcome to Down Ballot, where we have uh, Star Wipes, and uh, we have two hosts, and one of the hosts has a fucking beer and a baby. How you doing, Councilman? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Producer Dave? Good, good. Just uh, finally sort of used to where everything is located on this desk and in this broader space now. Is it a uh, sort of blessing and a curse to have more space? I was meaning to ask you this. The curse that happened was all of the boxes of items that showed up that people sent to us because then we had to install like club lighting. Like it's like a dance club in here. Oh, nice. I got to get over at some point. I'm so sorry. I haven't been, yeah. Even, been even if you could just stop by for a little while, if you happen to be on the South side, doesn't matter what day or whatever. You just pop by and say hi and take a look. Um, more space for is sure. good. More space is good. Um, 
it's real good like for local love because if there's people chilling there's room mm-hmm. of course but, and you can and- but we've still crammed all the equipment into a small area because it's better to have less it's better to just not have long cable runs everywhere right right um but a better space for musicians too to spread out and do their thing and actually perform i mean they yeah the space over just to my right um well, i have my dj coffin set up because drawing heaven won't be performing tonight but it's better because there's more room we have a couple mic stands like floor standing right. also people in our community sent us those and we had to fucking run cables to those <laughs> thank you to the community i mean it's a it's a good problem to have to have people sending you free shit so thank you so much to the community for coming through on the wish list i think above and beyond <clears throat> yeah above and beyond is more like it like we have two more of those kind of uh par the this the up the up the up up the lights that we have up we have two more of them that we need um we have a disco ball oh very nice the light for it we need a second one but uh it's not a real studio until you have a disco ball really i mean it's 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 been pretty amazing actually to be perfectly honest like the stuff people sent us i mean like somebody sent us the innards of a new computer essentially hot yeah (laughs) that was i mean people i mean i don't know i'd have to add it up twenty five hundred three thousand dollars worth of stuff came from the community I mean, those innards, I would know thing one about what to do with them, but I'm sure you were excited. Uh, more than three times the performance. Yeah, the computer is bored right now. Nice. <laughs> computer is quite bored. That's fabulous to hear. That's fabulous to hear. And just thinking back to my first appearance on this show when it was on a, a table, like a couple tables, I think, Jerry rigged in your living room um, to now. It's just, it's just an amazing arc. So c- kudos to you and kudos to the community for being here and for representing and for staying staying with us yeah not for nothing thanks to uh jared monster that's a media winch's man for helping us with any of the installation stuff that we were um maybe maybe not that we couldn't do but that we that he's quite handy so he would do a better job of the installation than we would you know he put up all the lights made sure he also has some background in photography and lighting and stuff so he made where we wanted to put the lights was he was like no don't put them there do that do it like this nice and he works for weed um, no, he didn't. We, I don't know. We didn't pay him anything. Oh shit. Even better. Free, <laughs> I mean, free he's, labor. He's, he smokes whatever weed he finds around here, obviously, but right. Um, it's probably, probably enough. There's like a quarter in the keyboard, right? On your desk, right? At yeah. Least. I got to replace this keyboard. Some of the keys don't work. Cause I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's fucking weed in the way of the keyboard it's switches here. Um, ship, you know, more space. Uh, it's, it, it was a curse at first because I wanted to use more of the space, but I got talked out of it. Ah, interesting. So, so is there is there like empty space that's just not being used, or is it being used for some other purpose? Like there's storing like couches and health? chairs and a table and cool. <clears throat> like cool. if you check out any of the video from Local Love behind the guest, you'll be able to see all of us just chilling there. Oh, very cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, our space here has gotten ob- obviously a lot more cramped. Uh, the Good Wife and I since the arrival of. Let me see if I can do this. The it bad baby. Bad baby. Hi, oh, everybody. She is somehow sleeping right now. Um, uh, so we'll we'll hope that she remains that way. Um, but if I do have to run away for a second, I'll let you know and put her down. Um, but nah, just run away. Don't let us know. <laughs> um, but the good wife is heading out actually in a little bit. So we're gonna we're gonna have an experiment here to see how long she lasts. But she's doing pretty well, and she likes the dulcet tones of dad's voice. So very nice. She should, she should be okay. But um. Uh, yeah. How, anything ex- uh, exciting going on with local love tonight? Or it sounds like you had a band that cannot make it. Oh no, we have drawing heaven. They're, they're here for an interview, just not a performance. Cause they're like a heavier oh. band and nice, it, yeah. it's, they're not, they're not uh real. It wouldn't the acoustic performance. They weren't, they weren't good for it. And I'm real glad cause I don't have to tear down all my fucking DJ equipment and just uh, leave it yeah. there. For sure. And then the loud, you know, metal would probably wait, you know, wake the neighbors or something. Do you have any like audio, buffering in the in the studio there or any no sort of we're just case? not we just treat it like we treated the old studio it, it we just don't turn up there's no nobody's allowed to, like bands aren't bringing guitar amps here right right they're not playing full band right uh, i mean i'd probably turn up the, the the sound a little bit louder when i'm djing because mm-hmm. there's more room like there's no nobody's bedroom is like on the other side of the wall right next to where the speaker is but we're just right. now um we're, I have some, we have some sound absorption stuff. We still haven't put that up. It's going to go. There's a wall that connects to the house that we're going to probably put all the sound stuff on, but it's not really for like making the, um, the show sound better. We figured out real quick that the soundproofing, it's not that it's the mics and everything else we've done. Like yeah. that, the, the sound absorption stuff didn't help. It doesn't do what for what we're doing. It's, it's not going to be noticeable. Got it. 
Well, like, we'll do a whole show on that sometime. We, we in fact, should. At some point, we are going to have to do a whole show about how good this show sounds. <laughs> Not for nothing. You said that into a $20 microphone like almost five years ago or something. And it still sounds great. So um, I've got a slightly better microphone now. But um, thanks to you, of course. This is the pizza mic from back in the day, by the way, without the pizza box. Oh, still, cool. Still pizza mic. Cool. Yeah, we had um, a, a, one box. of the mic stands had a pizza box on it. I remember that. I still have the pizza box. I kept I couldn't bear to, to throw it out. It was a memento. <laughs> so we'll frame it. We'll bronze it. One day, um, anyway. one day when we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of concurrent viewers on just a regular stream, that pizza box will be worth some fucking money. Hell yeah, and I'll I'll bust it out for sure on our aniver- for our anniversary. Um, well, uh, shall we get into the docket? We've got a few stories tonight, and we'd love to get through through it all and get you onto local love expediently. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, um, leading off, uh, you may have caught this story if you've been following local news. We've been meaning to get, the good wife and I have been meaning to get this into the docket for a couple weeks now. Um, Foster City, up on the peninsula here in the Bay Area, has had an influx of uh, tourism, but not what you would expect. And now they're trying to figure out what to do about it. So we're going to learn more from uh, NBC Bay Area. Thank you very much, Mike. 602 right now. And happening today, there's a rally against a controversial plan in Foster City to kill 100 geese. Yeah, today in the Bay is Ginger Conahero Saab. She's live for us in Foster City. She has the latest on this strongly debated issue. And Ginger, has anything been decided just yet? Well, guys, not nothing just yet, but it has been a continuing problem for the city, a goose poop problem that Foster City is saying is... Did they have a goose poop riot? A health risk for humans. Now, the Canada geese... <laughs> oh, down ballot but um, ...more than 300 in recent years. The suggestion or the proposal to lethally remove them would affect about 100 geese, but protesters say any number is too much. Take a look at this video from the last protest on this issue back in July, where people from both sides of the debate had much to say. One oh, I thought this was the, the video. <laughs> I thought the geese were protesting. Geese were protesting. <laughs> that'd, that'd be great. ...should also be considered. But many say lethally removing the birds is inhumane, including San Mateo County Supervisor David Canepa, who is leading today's protest. In a recent tweet, he said, I disagree with Foster City's plan to get rid of its goose population. It's inhumane and does not solve any problem. The geese are a countrywide concern, and I stand against any plan to kill them. But in a video message posted from Foster City Council member Sanjay Gahani yesterday, he says, Fuck them geese. This is only one solution the council is entertaining. Be assured, we are not considering eradication nor extermination. You're talking about geese, right? Things are weird. (laughs) Things in this country are odd right now. Control the Canada goose population, which has doubled in Foster City over recent years and is projected to double again over the next few years. Now, he says the council is considering exploring other options to help solve this problem, like robot technology and also landscape modifications that might make Foster City less attractive to the geese. In the meantime, he says, urges the public to pick up the trash around the parks, just like this, where the protest later today is set to happen. Uh, You know, do not do anything that's going to make the birds want to come and stay in Foster City, like feeding them. And if you have any comments or suggestions, go ahead and email geese at fostercity.org. The council wants to hear your suggestions. Marcus and Laura. An email and be all honk, 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 honk. <laughs> I mean, gu- guaranteed this started because some Foster City residents, you know, down by the, the, the Bay Shore or whatever, started feeding geese. And the geese know. I mean, animals know when, you know, where they can get food, right? Like seagulls go to the ballpark, right? At the end of the game, geese come to Foster City apparently and get fed. And it's just become, you know, a big a big contingent now um but it's not the geese's fault they're just trying to find food right and, and they're migrating and foster city seems like a nice place to go my favorite thing about that was like the guy that came on second he's like don't worry eradication isn't the only thing we're thinking about right it's, it's it's, like- it's, it's, it's city council member trying to assure the public you know we're not just talking about a geese apocalypse or a, a <laughs> right. you know, ge- geese in asia we're we're um, also we're also thinking about um what is that uh um self-deportation of the geese <laughs> if we just ask them nicely they'll go away or, they'll, or we'll, if we ask the people in like menlo park to feed the geese maybe they'll migrate to menlo park we're just going to send them up to a farm up north don't worry about it they'll be fine they'll be fine um <laughs> but yeah so uh it, but if you consider it i mean you you might say well it's a few hundred geese no big deal a city like foster city only has a few thousand people living in it so the geese to people po- uh, ratio is probably pretty high 
Um, and as you can see, they're not exactly potty trained, so they go pretty much anywhere. And geese poop is no ma laughing matter. That is not like pigeon shit. That is like some serious golf ball size shit sometimes. So I, I understand the concern, but at the same time, I wish they could figure out some sort of other way. We'll, I'm find, just, we'll see. I'm just thinking of, you know, the the people that I see riding their bikes, right? Like on the trail and they're like mm -hmm. all tricked out, like Tour de France and shit. And I've got this little bike with, I might as well have a bell on it and it has fenders on it. And I just kind of fucking smoked a joint, like riding past them. They have like goose poop all up on their back because they were like trying to save a few fucking few grams on their bike by not having fenders. And I'd have no goose poop on me at all. It'd just be all up in my fenders. It must be at the people that are clamoring for the, the geese apocalypse. Maybe are uh, people with bikes without fenders. That could be like the sub, the, the Venn diagram is probably like capturing both of those people. I remember that uh, uh, that funny clip we played a while back with the guy talking about how the bicyclists stink up the park. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. I think we played that on like a like a like a Catterday, like a best of segment or something. I forget. Yes, what we were. <laughs> very, very much so. Damn bicyclists and pedestrians and people. They were forcing for the people. Our parks would be awesome. Well, there are um, plenty of places that might look a little bit like a park that don't have people. We call it the wilderness, and I'm afraid of it. Right. Well, uh, sort of the antithesis of the wilderness, who I rhyme there, um, is Taco Bell, from my, my personal <laughs> opinion. So, uh, uh, as we as we all know, um, anti Asian hate has taken a lot of forms uh, lately, and has has come out to come home to roost in a lot of communities, especially in the Bay Area. Um, we've got an example here of actually South Asian hate, and it's actually South Asian self hate. Um, uh, in, Indians attacking fellow Hindus, um, and apparently it's happening at. Taco Bell, which begs the question, of course, why the hell are you eating at Taco Bell in the first place? Um, you're just begging. You're begging for trouble because you're high. <laughs> so we're going to find out more from NBC Bay Area about what happened here and, and what's being done. New at 11, an old hatred with a new playbook. Many in the local Hindu community say there's been a recent rise in Hindu phobia. A Taco Bell in Fremont is the latest example. The alleged victim recording the entire confrontation. Now, we've blurred the video since the man is currently not considered a suspect of a crime. Here's NBC's Audrey Assistio. You're disgusting, dog. Seriously. The verbal attacks, very specific. You look nasty, all right? Don't come out in public like this again. Sincerely. Nobody comes in public like this. Dirty we violating the Taco Bell dress code. He was inside this Taco right. Bell in Fremont to pick up food when this man began to verbally attack him. He buries in here, man. Even spitting at him at one point. What does this guy to do with me? And why is he abusing me? What did I do wrong to be here? Jay oh, you didn't do anything wrong, dude. That guy's an asshole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Took out his phone and started recording. I was scared, to be honest with you. I mean, I was, I was um infuriated you know, on the one hand but you know i was scared that what if this guy becomes too belligerent and then um, you know comes after me and the confrontation continues for over eight minutes before you see police arrive many in fremont's hindu community shaken up i think that video is so horrific but not surprised it's sort of what we have been dreading for a while uh, we've been seeing an increasing number of attacks on Hindu Americans. Pushpita Prasad is with the Coalition of Hindus of North America, a grassroots organization for Hindu education. So Hindu hatred has been around for a while and it is unfortunately surfacing right now, um, partly because there are a lot of actors uh, that are sort of creating a lot of hate. Jay Araman says what upset him even more is, turns out his alleged attacker is also Indian. He has spoken to Fremont police and the district attorney. While upset over the incident, he says he still loves living in Fremont. Uh, just like any other city in Bay Area, I mean, it's very diverse and uh, we absolutely love it here. So I I'm just, you know, appalled that this has happened. The Fremont Police Department confirms they are actively investigating the incident. No word yet if the man in that video will face charges. Raj, Jess. I don't think the guy in the video did anything illegal. No, more than likely not. Uh, just harassing someone like verbally is not necessarily um, going to uh, result in a crime, other than you know his awful fashion sense. Um, I think I missed something here in the story because um, this is billed as you know anti Hindi or Hindu hate um, and and an attack, and yet I, maybe they missed something in reporting, but I didn't hear anything or see anything or hear hear anything paraphrase that the guy said that was specifically like targeting this guy because he was. Hindu. I'm sure there was if he perceived that, but they must have missed that in the story. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just say, say, you know, first crime is just going to Taco Bell. So if you want to avoid like yahoos and jackasses, just don't go to Taco Bell. It's a very simple solution. So Not the, that five, five guys is immune, but. So um, India is, I think, um, majority or plurality Hindu, but that Correct. doesn't mean that the, the other guy having himself been was. Indian was Correct. Hindu. Um, right, he could be Buddhist, he could be Sikh, he could be a lot of, or just non-affiliated at all, like, right? Or, or Muslim agnostic. or any, any Christian. Yeah, Muslim. Who, yeah. Muslim. Yeah, he, there's he, a heavy he, Muslim population in India. So, yeah. and we didn't, like, hear the entire exchange. There may have been, like, dog whistles, and there may be dog whistles yeah. that we don't understand. It's true. That's true. That's very true. Um, but, yeah, so th- this is just another example, of, again, of what happens when you go to Taco Bell. So, um, try, try Chipotle next time. They're a little classier. <sighs> Uh, and order ahead, you know, order ahead, get it, get it online and just pick up the bag and leave. And that way you don't have to do it. You're going to deal with yahoos in line at fast food restaurants, no matter what, some of them might get racist, but they're all going to be idiots. So just avoid the line order online. That's my philosophy. I used to be much more adamant about go to the place, talk to a human, get them to make your food right in front of you. I've had enough orders screwed up by people I'm watching make the order as I have you know, people <laughs> leaving the order for me on the shelf. So whatever, make, make it for me in advance. If, if it doesn't, if it has tomatoes and I ask for no tomatoes, I'll eat around the tomatoes. Yeah. And not for nothing. If they do fuck up your order and it's not like something you're allergic to and you just get like uh, the wrong thing, maybe try it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 occasionally I will, if it's for the good wife, I will not definitely not be doing that. Um, because she wants what she wants. Um, so we're getting what she wants, but yeah, I'll, I'll be adventurous occasionally. I had an incident the other day, not to get off the subject too much, but I won't name the restaurant, but I've never seen this before where the, nothing on my order made it into the bag. Like it was someone else's in order entirely mm. put into my bag with my tag, with all my order on it, there is day, but nothing on that tag was in my bag. So I, yeah, they, they, just put, some, they just put the shit in the wrong bag. I mean, that's all correct. And the ways is that, you know, two people basically have two meals wasted because they probably didn't want my food or maybe they ate my food, but I didn't want their food. So uh, waste of food, waste of time. But they did give me store credit for some free food down the road. So there's that. So anyway, so, uh, anyway the next story is about Silicon Valley Pride. It looks like I'm playing the night event. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it looks like I'm, I'm closing out the night event. They probably heard a mix of me playing disco. And what I'm going to do, actually... Is I'm gonna nice. we're gonna play a little bit of uh, booty breaks in Miami bass and see if like any of them tired old queens will bust a hip trying to get low. We'll there see. You go. <laughs> Let's, we'll see if we have if we have an injury not because of like a stampede but just because somebody was just trying to get a little lower. Maybe their hips do lie and said you could get that low. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's, you just can't get that low. It's uh, not. It's, bo- it's not all the way set up, but they don't have. They didn't. Ha- they didn't book it out, and somebody said that they, they're pretty sure. And it's somebody that has booked me before for that. So it looks like I'll be uh-huh. closing out the uh, night event there. So that'll be fun. I'll have fun. Well, this is a story about um, uh, what's going on with um, our San Jose police have in the past participated in pride events, but um, there's been a recent um, interest in you know, keeping their guns and their uniforms and just the, the general police presence um, out of the the parade. So here's a story about um, what's going on this year. It's Pride weekend in Silicon Valley, and the festivities include a parade which takes place on Sunday. This parade, though, won't include San Jose police officers. This is the second year in a row. The chief put the kibosh on officers marching in that parade because the Pride organizers won't allow the officers to carry their firearms. Wait a minute. Is that police? You're marching in a parade. You don't need a gun. Headquarters One would hope not. You'll see only on NBC Bay Area. We're exclusive. Both sides, Silicon Valley Pride and San Jose Police, say they are disappointed with the other's decision, but both say they're optimistic they'll reach a compromise for next year. The Pride flag flies proudly again over San Jose Police headquarters, but there was bad news today. The chief announced that officers will not be participating in this weekend's South Bay Pride festivities. It's certainly disappointing. It all stems from a dispute over the formal police uniform. The department asked to participate in full uniform. Silicon Valley Pride agreed, but asked for the officers not to wear their duty belts, including their firearms. We originally had asked uh, Chief Mata and uh, SJPD to come in a a softer look, to come represent with their softer uniform. In the end, come dress like a detective. Right. 
so they cannot march in the parade. Or like the short sleeve, you know. The chief can decide upon the shorts, maybe. Male policy that is standard for our our sworn personnel. Organizers say much like the. Don't wear what Steve Aponte's wearing. Disappointed. To them, allowing full uniforms was a compromise from last year. They say they feel they need to uphold the beliefs of the local LGBTQ plus community, which has had a complicated and sometimes traumatic history with law enforcement. No shit. The trauma and the history does not represent all law enforcement, but it's still there. And, you know, the understanding needs to come on both ends and not just ours. While officers won't participate in the parade, they will be out protecting it in full uniform. Silicon Valley Pride said it even offered San Jose Police and the Sheriff's Department a recruiting table at the festival with officers wearing their customary polos and concealed weapons. San Jose Police declined. The Sheriff's Department accepted. They were just thrilled. Oh, we could come back? That sounds fantastic. Organizers say... The, oh, the Sheriff's Department's stand. fucked up, too. Good job, SDPD. Their mind right. by Sunday. If not, they'll go back to the drawing board and try to find a new compromise for next year. In San Jose, Damien Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. The, the, the fucking, the like, could you please dress down and not come armed is like not an unreasonable thing to ask. I'm sorry. Not at all. Like po- polos and, and concealed weapons. That's a good look for a parade, honestly. And you can still very clearly designate yourself as a police officer. I mean, come on. Anyone who's seen an officer, no matter if they're in uniform or not, kind of guesses what they're doing, right? Like, you know, you a cop, right? You, you, can, you can spot a cop a mile away, no matter what they're wearing. So it's not that, that's not the big deal. It's really just the, it's symbolic, really. And like you said, you're in a parade, right? You've got officers who are assigned to the parade who are there for security and safety, right? They're not in the parade, but they're certainly monitoring the parade. They're, they're, they're keeping the road closed, right? They're monitoring traffic. They're, you know, doing that. So there's cops there in uniform already. The ones who are in the parade, like, why, yeah, why should they be in full uniform with guns? Like, def- absolutely dress down. Wear a goddamn, like, rainbow tutu for all I care. Like, you know, right. like, like, you're trying to bond, you're trying to bond with the community. So bond with the community. And they're probably, I, I would assume they're not on duty when that's happening, right? They're not, I, I, I don't know. But like it depends. It depends. I don't. I don't know how that works. To be honest with you, but it, it could be an easy, sh- easy fix to just have them be off duty and volunteering. Right. And like, I don't know. Like, I'm not allowed to fucking walk down. I'm not allowed to like strap up to like to go play my DJ set or whatever. So what? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. They, I don't. There's some agreement that you have to sign, right? I don't read the thing because I just presume it's you know codes of conduct that are similar to doing other events that I've done in the past. But like, yeah, if you like, I don't know, like. A lot of other cities are just like, don't march in our parade. Like, it's really funny, too, because a lot of the stories we've been covering about the sheriff's department, the sheriff's department is in fucking disarray. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, and they're about to get a new sheriff or there's a new sheriff in town. Um, one white dude to the other. So we'll see what happens. But, yeah, it's you're right. It's they've got their heads up their ass. And yet on this one thing, they can get it right. Yeah, they're like they weren't even asking them not to carry. They were just like, put it in your conceal. pocket. Yeah, conceal it. You've got this. The sheriff's office gives all of those concealed carry permits, right? So use them. Yeah, it's just oh, it's man. just stupid. Yeah, if, if I just think that it should be like general policy for Pride. If the cops want to march in Pride, they should show up unarmed, like like every other organization. Yeah, and it's funny, it's, and it's it's clear that it's the chief, right? It's administration that's saying this. It's not like rank and file cops. If there's a cop there out there, rank and file, who wants to march in the Pride parade, God bless him. You know, I'm sure that they would be more than happy to dress however you w- they want for the parade. But it's it's the chief that's saying that's putting this decree down and the administration and putting the kibosh on it. It's not the individual cops. and It's not pride. But I'm sure the pride folks would welcome officers if they would you know dress down a little bit. So, well, it's uh, they just it's they, kind of unfortunate. I don't, I don't think they even asked them not to wear their uniform. I'd say don't wear your uniform. I'd yeah, say yeah, no, they, they the, dress the, down. Yeah. Right. They weren't. I'd say don't wear your uniform. That's an intimidating uniform. But you mm-hmm. can, people can have badges or, you know, them shirts they got, them yeah. little polos yeah. with the little star on it so that they're, you know, that they might exactly. wear to a press conference. I, I actually have one myself because I used to work um, adjacently to the, the police officers union. So I even have one of those polos in my closet. I could bust out anytime. Oh, where'd my co-host go? Oh, Classy. <laughs> what happened Classy. to my it's co-host? Got, got oh, shit. Know, right? We had to fire the councilman. <laughs> <laughs> and they came in and they came in and got me. They took me out. Um, they're like, don't, don't give away our secrets. Um, yeah, no, one of the one of the weirdest experiences ever in my life was working for the poli- or consulting for the police officers union. Um, never again. I could tell some stories. Yeah, it just seems like like in this case, they it's not the just I if if the, I can't imagine them being on the clock to do this. Um, 
it might be i i don't know how i don't know how these things work to be honest with you um so uh there are rules around wearing your uniform in general um when you're in public there are rules around that i don't know that they couldn't be you know amended or, or massaged or just ignored for instances like these right like you know governments suspend rules all the time to do what they want to do if it's the right thing to do so you know i don't think any of those any regulations should should prohibit this it's really just an administrative decision they don't want to they don't like the look so they don't want to do it i mean I that's think, unfortunate i think it's just I just think it's that it's, it's just intimidating. And I think that yeah. Some, yeah, somebody, somebody at the, uh, at the top of the food chain doesn't want to show up in an unintimidating fashion. So right. well, better it's, the luck same, next it's, year. This, it's adjacent to them just continuing to argue for the need for, you know, military style weapons and, you know, flashbangs and, and projectiles and rubber bullets and tanks and all this stuff. It's, you know, they, they want to feel like the big, dudes on campus and they want to, they want to intimidate. They feel like part of their job is to intimidate and to keep people in fear of them. Um, so it's, but it's all part and parcel. This might be a, seem like a minor thing, but it's definitely, part, you're right. It's definitely tied to that mentality. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I, I can't imagine they would be on duty. And if, yeah. if the thing was, they were on duty, I think you fix all of this by just being like, well, you can't get paid for the time that you do this. Yeah, and then you just, time. then you're showing up like, like the people from IBM, like if they march in the parade, they don't have to wear their IBM badge, right? Like they could just show up have dressed for a fucking Sunday and go march with IBM. Like if there's a group, they could have a banner that says, you know, Hey, IBM employees for, for LGBTQ pride, right? Like same thing with PD, like SGPD officers for, for pride, right? Something like that. Just, or a button, right? Yeah, you're right. They don't even have to uniform up. Right. Um, because they're, they're just, they're participant. Like it's, you know, like the IBM people aren't on the clock. They happen to be right. members of IBM, but they're participating in this. And this is a fucking person who th happens to work at IBM. Like, right. so it's just, this is all dumb. This is just a bunch of fucking, this is just a bunch of big D contest shit. And like, yeah. it's stupid that it's playing out in a place like San Jose. Like, it's like, what kind of, like, this is the kind of thing you thing you'd think would play out and like it would play out more in San Francisco or Oakland like this. It's kind of right. territorial pissing in San Jose is stupid because this is like a poor excuse for a fucking city anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, don't don't feed into the inferiority complex. Um, well, in other news related to San Jose police and public safety, um, they are becoming more of a, we are becoming more of a police state um, as mentioned earlier, and part of that includes um, license plate readers, which are now being installed throughout the city. Um, they're leveraging a state law. This isn't just us that's doing this in San Jose, but uh, we're going to learn more about what these license plate readers are there to do and who's going to be the loser in this situation. They're about the size of a cell phone, but the memory they're storing is supposed to help police catch criminals and deter a variety of crimes like hit and runs, vehicle thefts, and even sideshows. But are these license plate readers working? One local business owner doesn't think so. They put a fence for pedestrians so they wouldn't cross and I guess they were getting ran over. And I've seen that fence been replaced a few times already. So that means that cars are still going over the lane and so forth. His business is right on Monterey and Kirtner, one of the most dangerous intersections in the city and the first to get this technology. The cameras you can see right above me were installed here in April as part of a pilot program police say is working. In fact, they say just this week they were able to solve an armed robbery and arrest a suspected shooter thanks to these cameras. During a forum to update the community, police also mentioned success stories in other cities like Vallejo, where they're reporting a 100% increase in identifying stolen vehicles. So now San Jose says it's installing hundreds around the city, around 150 to be exact. And the first batch is coming in the next two. Well, that's not hundreds. Those particular cameras will be placed in neighborhoods where we have um, incidents or high incidents of gun related crimes. The biggest concern among those attending today's virtual forum was privacy. But the city made it clear the data is only shared with trained police officers and certain city staff, no out of state or federal agencies. Any time that someone from San Jose Police Department accesses the ALPR system, they have to input a reason, the specific plates they're looking for, and all of that information is logged so that we can keep track of how many times it's being used, what it's being used for. In San Jose, Stephanie Magallon, NBC Bay Area News. 
digital privacy officer that was that guy's job that's a little Orwellian. Yeah. that's just uh, yeah you gotta love the new titles in city government there's a few of those chief information officer right like what is that exactly um ministry of information uh so yeah coming soon to a theater near you san jose has been reluctant in the past to embrace um public safety technology um there was a pushback on uh red light cameras um which is why we don't have really red light cameras in san jose at all right now um because there was pushback when they were first installed and so you don't see them around this is something a little bit different um but it's still in the same ballpark and yeah there are legit concerns about you know who's getting this information what it's being used for um it goes back to that you know it, the recent case of the what was it the, the the rape kit that was used to you know uh uh, arrest someone for a crime or some sort of burglary like you know years ago um, and it's supposed to be private information so th it's adjacent to that and i think we're you know you're already hearing it from aclu and other privacy uh privacy oriented groups um but it, it, it's a balance right it's it's it, the city's gonna say it's a balance well we need to keep the public safe and we need to um be able to respond and use technology to respond to issues more effectively and efficiently and catch criminals um, but at the end of the day, it's a surveillance state you're setting up. You're, you're saying you're basically saying that you don't have the resources and the human power to do your job, or you're just spending resources in the wrong ways. You don't you don't really you're not really solving crimes. Um, so you're going to try and get tools like this to help you do it um, at what expense, right? So yeah, think what you want about it, um, but it's 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 coming. It's not like it's not it's not like this isn't coming down the pike in a lot of ways. So you know, I'm just. Those fucking cameras ain't going to be in my neighborhood or yours, buddy. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic point, right? Like, where was it, right? Tully and Kurtner, right? In the heart of one of the more, shall we say, diverse neighborhoods or, or districts in the city, right? right. We're not going to find them in Willow Glen and Almaden Valley, right? Right. And well, it's because it's in this self-perpetuating cycle, right? It, they're going to be placed in high crime areas, right? Well, what's a high crime area? It's an area where there have been a lot of crimes, right? Or gun violence or sideshows, things that they're trying to combat. Well, where are those things happening? Predominantly, they do happen in lower income communities and in people, uh, communities that are dominated by people of color, right? Um, because the things that they're targeting are in those communities. So therefore, they put the surveillance in those communities. They catch more people doing bad things in those communities. The numbers go up in those communities and they say, oh, well, we've got a hotspot, right? right. It's like an ice it, cream it, cone that licks itself. Correct. And it just keeps perpetuating itself, just like redlining, just like any other racist uh, policies. Yes, there may have been a good at the time from some people, but the underlying theme is racism. And if you don't stop the cycle and stop what you're doing for a minute to see it, even the most well-intentioned people, the most well-intentioned white people, um, and even the most well-intentioned brown people in elected office and officials can miss the forest for looking at the trees, right? You, we need to take a step back sometime sometimes almost with every one of these policies, take a step back and not think about, oh, the real hot button stuff like privacy and technology. Think about how it's impacting, you know, real world uh, situations, people, ethnicities, uh, diversity, the, the you know, how our cities run, the character of our city, not just the dollars and cents, not just the the numbers, right? Look at how, look at the unintended consequences. So hopefully they do, but I doubt that they will. <laughs> So this next story, we've been following in a little while. This is there's this this public works guy who, I mean, but if the if the fucking law enforcement's going to go after somebody, I feel like this public works guy from San Francisco is the is the candidate, right? It's the it's the example. Yes. It's like actually sometimes we get the bad guy, <laughs> right? Sometimes we do we do root out public corruption, and when we do, we're going to make a point out of you know showing you the per the face of public corruption over and over and over again, right? Like they. Um, they're going to nail this. They're going to drive this home. We got, we got one, but, uh, yeah, San Francisco, get your shit together. <laughs> we'll get there. Not quite yet, but anyway, we'll hear more. Now, with the much anticipated sentencing of the man at the center of San Francisco's ongoing public corruption scandal, former public works director, Mohammed Nuru left federal court today, facing seven years in prison. Now, Nuru was the central figure in the FBI's bribery and corruption case that now also includes other public officials and business people. Investigative reporter Jackson Vanderbecken broke some of the first stories on this investigation into Nuro and was in court when the sentence was handed down. At Jackson, uh, prosecutors wanted nine years, so they got really close with the sentencing of seven years. Right, that's, uh, that's right. What we had here was a judge who seemed to be very concerned about what he's seen in the courtroom. He talked about 
this issue of the betrayal of public trust, the, the backers, there was an audible gasp for the supporters of Nuru in court when he came down with that seven-year sentence, which was on the high side, closer to what the prosecutors wanted. And so we know that in this case, the judge had this harsh line saying that what he saw here was worse than some gang homicides in the term of, of betraying the public's trust. And now we know also that although Nuru had nothing to say when he left court, the attorneys handed out a statement saying, uh, quote, again, I want to apologize to the people of San Francisco for my misconduct. I look forward to the time that I can return to serving my community and work to repair the damage that my actions caused both the city and my family. But Nuru, as the oh. central figure in the San Francisco corruption scandal, former Public Works Director Mohammed Nuru admitted to having accepted several hundred thousand dollars worth of bribes from contractors working in the city in exchange for insider help. In fact, prosecutors call him the quintessential grifter whose reign of bribery and corruption lasted a dozen years. They say he tipped off his friends in the city about the FBI probe after he initially agreed to cooperate. Exhibit A in the government's case was this Calusa County vacation home. In their sentencing motion, prosecutors called it truly a monument to his grifting. They say Nuru built it with a quarter million dollars in free or cut rate contractor labor and a John Deere tractor given as a bribe. Prosecutors say even the soil the house is built on came courtesy of the city's trash hauling monopoly, Recology, for Nuru's insider help securing lucrative deals. Recology has pled guilty to criminal corruption. Nuru also tapped a so-called slush fund, paid for by Recology and other contractors that he used for everything from t-shirts and caps to event fees for workers. Our investigative unit first reported the fund was run by a city nonprofit, the San Francisco Parks Alliance. You know, one thing we know that the prosecutors were managed to get Nuru to agree to give up that home. And uh, that home is, uh, had countless hours of uh, worker efforts, uh, just an incredible amount of work, all in the furtherance of what prosecutors consider a giant corruption scheme. Okay, thank you very much, Jackson. Uh, Jackson Vanderbeek, and we'll see him next on the Millennium Tower episode, too. But, uh... So a sad story ends with seven years in prison for this guy, which I think is reasonable and uh, hopefully is one of those uh, uh, you know, message sending sentences meant to say, like, don't be corrupt. Don't do crimes. So Obey the public will. So I like how the word grifter kept showing up in the uh, in the documents. I feel like maybe the prosecution has been uh, watching me on Wednesdays primarily. <laughs> More than likely. I mean, I, if, if you're not watching IDT, by the way, you definitely need to be doing that. It's um, it's uncovering threads that, you know, you, you, you wouldn't even think about yourself, but become all too real and all too obvious once they are revealed. But yes, follow IDT. Anyway, um, yeah, this uh, this is our own little mini version of it, frankly. Um, we've got a, a grifter in public. And, and it's it's interesting to how public service tends to attract grifters, right? Um, because there is such opportunity for corruption. Um, and at the end of the day, you wonder, like, do people get attracted to public service to do corruption or do they do corruption because public service jobs just don't pay a whole lot and they got into it with good intentions. And now they're like, I'm getting mine. I'm going to get paid. Even if I'm, uh, I'm doing this shitty job for the rest of my life, I'm going to get paid. Um, I'm guessing that's what happened here. Yeah. You know, it's or, okay. What, whatever. It's okay. I mean, I, I deserve it. You know, it's, it's a nonprofit it's helping people. Or there was <clears throat> like corruption going on and this guy decided he'd dip, dip his hand in the cookie jar. And then he was like, mm -hmm. you know what? I see another cookie jar over there. Actually, I'm gonna put my hand in that one too because that one's full. <laughs> Nobody right, else is dipping right. their hand like in this, that one. Yeah, that one's got too many hands in it. Like this one over here. Like I could, I can have this one to myself. I can have all the cookies. Um, and it's pretty, pretty creative uh, plan. But uh, yeah, a uh, foiled. And of course, they're going to make an example out of him, right? They ca you catch someone red-handed, you're going to make an example out of him. Try and try and root it out other ways, right? And 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 uh, try to um, uh, disincentivize it. Um, so that's what this sentence is about, more than likely. So good on the judge for for doing that and for following through. Um, we'll see if this if he appeals and if he gets a lighter sentence. I'm guessing that might happen. He probably he strikes me as the kind of guy that can hire an attorney with all of his corruption money. 
Um, I did that like I like that nice touch of like being on the phone, like fake on the phone on the way into court, and then fake on the phone coming out of court. So you don't necessarily have to. I mean, you don't have to answer any questions anyway, but you know you have a nice excuse. Uh, I'm busy. I'm I'm talking talking to my baby. I'm talking, talking to here. Boo. I'm talking here. I'm talking here. I'm talking to my talking to my wife. I'm talking to my mom. <laughs> We're talking about what we have for dinner. Anyway, uh, so we'll, if there's any more on that story, we'll definitely bring it to you. Um, and if there's any more on the uh, corruption beyond Mr. Neuer, we will definitely bring that to you here on Down Ballot. But wanted to circle back on that because oftentimes we have stories on Down Ballot that, you know, just unfortunately don't get a resolution. We don't get follow up. We don't get, you know, the, the full story. What happened next? It's just sort of this shit happened or it's about to happen. And that's it. And they the news gets a nice hit. They get to get some viewers out of it but they don't have feel any obligation to follow up on the story and we're, we're out here thinking like what's the rest of the story so we are here at down ballot to help you understand the full story if we are if we are able to do it in stories that that's never going to happen on we're going to move on to our ongoing coverage of the millennium tower in san francisco we'll keep covering it as long as there's as long as it's a story um but yeah it doesn't seem like there's ever going to be an end to this until they tear the fucking place down it's one of the most expensive mistakes in San Francisco, and they're still trying to fix it. The new building permit now has been issued for the leaning and sinking Millennium Tower. NBC's investigative reporter Jackson Vanderbecken continues with his exclusive reporting on the luxury tower. As you can see, construction crews behind me are digging on this side of the northwest side of the building. They've already installed 18 piles to bedrock. And the city now says, that's enough. Those 18 piles go down to bedrock to anchor the high rise to something solid and immovable. Engineers believe that should finally stop the Millennium Tower from sinking and tilting and even reverse some of the lean. But each time crews started drilling and digging to install each of the piles, it caused the building to lean and sink even more. So a fix officials eventually scrapped their original plan to install 52 support piles and submitted a new one that it relies on just the 18 already in the ground. The plan is now to extend the foundation and attach one corner of the building to some of those 18 piles. But that requires even more digging. As you can see, crews are busy digging 25 feet down on the northwest side of the building. The load transfer from the existing foundation to the new perimeter piles is very complex. Veteran geotechnical engineer Bob Pike says by design, the piles are not supposed to be rigid, but more like adjustable cushions. And he worries that with only 18, the piles won't function as well as if there were 52. You don't stop continuing settlement. And so that's a basic flaw in the design. Now that the city has approved the plan, the work done at the corner of the tilting tower should be done by the end of this year. And fix engineers stand by their assertions that the 18 support piles are enough to stop the sinking. Jackson Vanderbecken, NBC, Bay Area News. Uh, Jackson has been covering this story from day one, and he continues yes, he to has. break new information on it. You can watch all of us. No, we're, we've watched all of the, the things on the Millennium Tower on their website. We've certainly seen them. most of them. All of them. Um, and when we've, I think we came up with, and you came up with the solution long ago. So we'll keep showing, we'll keep covering the story until they figure out the solution. But the real solution is tear the building down. Start over. Right. Or it's, it sucks, but like, what else are you going to do? Otherwise, like, otherwise we're going to have a bunch of like structural engineer grifters just making all kind of money going on the news all the time. And we can't have they that. They already are, right? And not just not to mention that, but the contractors that are working on it, right? Like, oh my God, the money that's being poured into this when they could just, and then all the tenants who are still living there, right? Ostensibly, oh, like, I'm not, I don't know about fucking shedding a tear for somebody with a $3 million apartment in the Millennium Tower. Oh, I'm not shedding a tear for them. It's more just like, you know, I, how in the world do you spend $3 million on a, on a condo and not like just be rioting in the streets over this, right? Like you should be suing the pants off of these people. Oh, um, I'm sure they're not rioting in the streets because they are, in fact, suing the pants off of people. <laughs> More than likely, yeah. Hope, hope, one would hope. But anyway, someone got sued. Someone has to pay. We'll see what happens. Um, well, moving on to speaking of getting your shit together, we do actually have a get your shit together segment this week. Um, and uh, the last two stories will probably qualify. But um, in the sinking neighborhoods department, apparently there's a whole neighborhood in San Francisco, not just a building, a whole neighborhood that's sinking now. So we're going to learn more about that from our friends at ABC7. 
Here at ABC 7 News, we talk about building a better Bay Area, and certainly a key part of that is infrastructure. And San Francisco has had its share of trouble in that regard. Well, now add sinking sidewalks and a lawsuit to the list. ABC 7 News reporter Luce Pena is here with the story. Luce? Dan, San Francisco's Mission Bay neighborhood is relatively a young neighborhood. About 24 years ago, the city approved the development of this area, and now sidewalks and roads are sinking. The concern many residents have now is that utilities and pipes could be impacted as the soil beneath the city sidewalks continue to settle. Before Chase Center, multi-million dollar constructions were going up. San Francisco's Mission Bay neighborhood was filled with dirt and rock in the 1800s. And now some parts of it are sinking. The edges around the buildings are, I don't know if they're rising or they're staying steady, but the, the uh, actual streets are sinking. Liana Lai has lived in the neighborhood for over seven years. Will Corral for 13 years. They're both noticing an increase in cracks on roads and sidewalks. As we're speaking, there could be some old lady tripping on one of those elevated tiles. Photos of sinking sidewalks are constantly coming in to the law office of Birding and Weil, Mission Bay residents who've paid for repair work through taxes or fees since October of 2020, are suing the city of San Francisco and demanding for the sinking sidewalks and roads to get fixed. This part of the building is on a big concrete slab. You could see the concrete here. And there are piers, and those piers go all the way through the bay fill, the bay mud fill, down to bedrock. So it's solid in place. But this sidewalk doesn't have any piers. In other words, the buildings are safe, but the sidewalks and roads will continue to sink. In the reports that were done before any of the building happened, they said that there would be as much as 24 inches of sinking over 50 years. But we're really less than 10 years into the development, and some areas have already sunk more than 18 inches. Some buildings are trying to fix the uneven sidewalks, but the gaps keep getting larger. In a statement, San Francisco's city attorney's office said, in part, the risk of subsidence was disclosed to all property owners prior to purchase. Also, these sidewalks are private sidewalks that are the responsibility of the property owners to maintain. But these attorneys want the city of San Francisco to take responsibility. No homeowner can actually repair the sidewalk correctly. It's not like you're just going to go out and replace a paver. You need to actually uh, dig deep into the soil. The lawsuit claims city officials ignored the weakness of the soil and should pay for these repairs. The city attorney's office said they will respond to the lawsuit and is considering all its options. As to a timeline, San Francisco has until October 6 to respond. In the newsroom, Luz Peña, ABC 7 News. I don't know even what um, I think about this. Like, it's just a, like an uneven sidewalk. I mean, if these people, I don't know, like. <laughs> like the fucking... city, city life, city life. You're going to deal with it eventually. So, you know, um, what do you think? You're going to move into a nice brand new community with everything spanking beautiful and perfect. No, it's a city. There's, there's warts. You're going to have to deal with the warts. And like, like the city said, they've disclosed all of the possible, uh, subsidence to you know tenants and owners before they bought in so i mean i understand if you're renting and maybe you you know weren't really given all the details by your your landlord um but even then you know it is it is what it is um i, I did like that one guy more than likely there's some old lady falling and dying right now as we speak <laughs> yes yeah. he's certain of it he's sure like, of it yeah i don't know i I mean, I guess they should try to fix it, but this is all overblown, and it almost seemed like it was like a commercial for that fucking law office. <laughs> like, right? Yeah, they 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 got a lot of play out of it. Um, it's another one of those stories that local news seems to specialize in, where they get a story from someone who's got a beef and or has an angle, right? Um, like these attorneys or a community group or a neighborhood association, right, or some sort of group that's got an angle and it's got a grift, right? Um, and that's their these lawyers' grift, and they run with the story. And yeah, they do reach out to the city and they reach out to the, the other players involved, right, of the government, but they don't really do a great job of like get, representing the government's take or the, or the whatever, the, or the, the other side of the story. They focus on the side that they were presented and they present that as fact, not as one side of the story. 
and they don't do the digging to, to find out what the, the true facts are. So that, that strikes me as what's happening here is that you've got some lawyers who, like you, as you say, are on the grift and are looking for more, more, uh, more game. Um, and they took on this case, they probably put out a press release and now they're getting on the news about it. And so they're getting some play regardless. Um, so good, good on them. They must be the winners in this situation. And not for nothing there. <clears throat> this is more like, a the city versus landlords, not the city versus homeowners that I right. like everywhere else in the city. I'd be willing to bet that there's a high, high percentage of people there who are renting, who maybe yes. they're dealing with the sidewalks, but if there's a big judgment, it's not like they're going to get a bunch of free months of rent out of it. You know what I'm saying? Right. There are, there are quite a few for sale condos in that mission Bay neighborhood, but there's a lot of renters too. Um, so th- yeah, they're, they're the ones that are really getting screwed because they're not getting disclosed all this information. Right. And they're moving into a, you know, a neighborhood with a certain understanding and they're just renting, right? They don't own the property. They weren't given all the information. So I feel for them. That's probably the, and the dogs that have to deal with the shitty uneven sidewalks. Oh, the dogs are going to be fine, dude. Um, well, shall we move down ballot? For yeah, the let's final, go, let's uh, move on to down ballot. Watch. I love when a story is about Los Gatos. <laughs> well, this one is uh, pretty uh, disturbing. I think well, let's just let the, the clip run. You, they'll, they'll explain what's going on here. But uh, more of that hate we saw prop up in Los Gatos last year um, is cropping up again. Very inflammatory and disgusting. That's how flyers found in downtown Los Gatos are being described this evening. On them, statements like no more rainbow sidewalks and no more forced acceptance. These flyers are targeting the LGBTQ community, a specific city council candidate and Black Lives Matter. NBC Bay Area's Stephanie Magallon has more. A huge no symbol over the words like LGBTQ+, BLM, and critical race theory. And plastered right on top is Rob Moore's name, a candidate for the Los Gatos City Council. Yeah, I was really upset when I first saw these flyers. I was definitely surprised. I wasn't expecting to see my name plastered all around downtown. About 50 of these flyers were taped on poles all along Santa Cruz Avenue Tuesday morning, but I'm told they weren't there for too long. Community members ended up stepping in and bringing them down immediately. Someone reached out to me and said that they were posting these and they reached out to me while it was happening. And that person said, hey, stop, you can't be doing this. And the people called her a pedophile and um, really got in her face and scared her. I showed the flyer to several people walking along downtown. Many couldn't believe what was written, Disgusting. including Gary Shipcaro, a local business owner who believes the same people behind these flyers harassed him in 2019 for his political views. Uh, that harassed us and have harassed lots of other people. I think the uh, former you know, Cooper? husband. Both Shipcaro and Rob describe the group as agitators, who they say a few months ago were interrupting city council meetings. <laughs> and attacking former mayor Marigal Sayoc. She was slandered racially, she was slandered for being a woman, she was slandered for her who her children were. And and so this group has really come after folks that are not white. But others I spoke with believe these flyers are a clear example of community members tired of agendas being Down forced onto them. People just want to live their life and do what they want to do without big government telling them this is what you can and can't do. I think that it's gotten a little out of hand. In Los Gatos. Works in Los Gatos. NBC Bay Area News. What the fuck were they were like, here, let's both sides this. Let's find some asshole walking down the street. Like, yeah. so the, the thing going on where that lady was like, what the fuck is with these signs? And they yelled at her, called her a child abuser or whatever. That's like, that's that whole thing's been playing out online for a while now where they're just yep. saying that if you are queer or if you support queer people or queer causes that you are either enabling or participating in child abuse it's like one of the oldest bigotries against queer people before uh, that it's been used <clears throat> the you can go all the way back to what was her name phyllis schlafly yeah or yeah, anita bryant in the right. 70s and so this yeah. is nothing new and um <clears throat> you know they've chose they choose places like los gatos or maybe the nicer area palo alto because they're not trying to fuck around and find out in a different part of town. Right. Well, they know they have an audience, right? There, there's, there's certainly an audience in Los Gatos for this. There's a, certainly an audience in Palo Alto. As much as our progressive friends in Los Gatos and Palo Alto would, would uh, shudder to admit it, there is definitely an audience for this in Los Gatos. Um, so there's a reason why it shows up there and not unlike, you know, in East San Jose or Milpitas or Cupertino. Um, uh, and... I, I give uh, this is a story where I don't know if 
candidate Moore, um, you know, brought this to the news. I know I saw it on his social media, which is where I found out about it. Um, and then they happened to cover it. Um, but this is actually, you know, it's not a bad thing for him in his campaign chances, right? This gets him on the air. It gets him in a, in a sympathetic victim kind of situation. Um, and gets, allows him to talk about his platform, which is great. And talk to all those people on status who are not bigots, um, which is the majority. Um, so hopefully he'll do fairly well in his, his race for council. Um, and he can play this into some more, um, publicity, which is really what you need to, to win local races, cynical as it might sound. Um, it sucks that it happened to him. It sucks that he was called out like this. I certainly never got to the point in my races where I had to endure any personal attacks. Um, and I don't know how I would have responded. He seems to be handling it well, um, and taking it in stride. Um, and, but it is what it is. Like it's, it's, it's nastiness and you just gotta like either, you know, ignore it, but you call it out, you, you, you point it out and you highlight it and you know, like we do on this show and other shows, you just keep keep calling it out and eventually either train people to deal with it or, um, you know, so hopefully, hopefully disincentivize it. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to move on to our next story. <clears throat> this is the, the, the headline here is pretty funny, actually. Uh, San Francisco yes. supervisor candidate refers to a Jewish journalist as a Nazi. Fuck, man. Yes. This Fuck, is a man. problematic candidate for a lot of reasons. So we're going to find out more uh, in this story from KTVU. Candidate for San Francisco supervisor is under fire now for calling a Bay Area Jewish journalist a Nazi. District 4 candidate Leanna Louie made this social media post. She referred to Mission local columnist Joe Eskenazi. Oh, no. Joe Eskenazi. This comes after Eskenazi recently reported that Louie may have voted in an election in a district she did not live in. Well, that led to an investigation by the city attorney. Louie later edited the post to remove the capitalized Nazi reference, but she's being criticized by local leaders. Now, several current board members of the supervisors have criticized that media post, and State Senator Scott Weiner tweeted, quote, <laughs> Scott Weiner's like, actual Nazis have come after yeah, that me, quote is excuse great. me. Anyone who's not an actual Nazi. <laughs> to refer to anyone who isn't an actual Nazi, particularly when it's directed at a Jew. The actual Nazis killed six men million Jews and millions of others, their lives are devalued by this kind of rhetoric. Well, that's like it. crazy. It's deeply disturbing to anyone who is not an actual Nazi, as if being called a Nazi wouldn't be disturbing if you were an actual Nazi. You'd be like, yes, I am, actually. Thank you very much for noticing. Um, but but well, the, I guess maybe, maybe you would. if you're a Nazi at this point, you're probably pretty proud of it, so he's probably right. So, But what he was doing there was not like he, he probably thought for a second before he made his response. And he's like, well, I don't want to downplay the fact that we actually do have a bit of a white nationalist, white supremacist problem here in the United States. And, you know, he personally has been the target of yes. uh, Austin Bennett, um, yeah. Joshua Coleman, trash can Joshua Coleman. Sorry, got to got to preface his name with trash can, possibly uh, affiliated with the cult of Scientology. Uh, Dan Badandi, Hamburglar Dan Badandi. That's somebody think in chat. Scott Wiener. Yeah. Uh, yes. Wow. Um, it's he's <clears throat> open, openly gay and Jewish, yeah. and wears sometimes to pride will wear a little bit of a little bit of leather. So they all think he's like you know, a, 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 housing he, too. So he's a he's a target for those kinds of people. Yeah. So his statement was real good because he made sure to be like, hey. Unless you're an actual Nazi, nobody should call you this. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yes. Yeah, I almost me. like I, I read the end of it almost as if you're insulting actual Nazis by calling this person a Nazi. <laughs> um, but yeah, like again, don't call people Nazis. Jesus Christ. This is actually a, a candidate who's been problematic for a variety of reasons. There was a, as they mentioned briefly, a residency question as to whether or not she actually lived and resides in the district she's running in, which is the Sunset uh, District 4. It's the west side of town, a little more Tony, um, represented by Eric Marr at one point. And you'll see from the, the B-roll, she was definitely a friend of the Noan Chesa, the Chesa recall, right? This is all part of that same ilk um, and that 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 m mood, uh, that idiom that's that's running for office in, in San Francisco. So she was already known as sort of an iconoclast before this, and she was almost kicked off the ballot because of that residency question. She got an appeal, and she she was able to stay on the ballot. But um, she has pulled back. From, apparently, she has pulled back her campaign materials a bit. So there's a question of whether or not she's going to drop out of the race after this. But we'll see. Um, she seems well, pretty stubborn. Even though the sunset's like a higher socioeconomic class, the people in the sunset at least have a certain perception of themselves, and mm -hmm. they're not going to vote for this lady. 
No, I don't think so. I think it's 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 definitely not the kind of uh, neighbor. Maybe, maybe like Pacific Heights or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> or those people have the same perception of themselves that they're not going to vote yeah. for that, that kind of lady either. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so she didn't have much of a chance to begin with, but she's going to make a lot of noise and we love noise here on, on down ballot. And we like to call out these folks when we see them. So keep an eye out for, if you saw her tweet, the extended, uh, or not tweet, but her, whatever that social media post, Instagram. She had, if you, yeah, Instagram. Thank you. If you read on in it, she, she links this reporter to like the weather underground. And she says, if you know the weather underground, you know this and that. And it's just this <clears throat> Word salad famous, of like famous me, neo Nazis, the weather underground. <laughs> right. Let me link. Let me link. You know, it's straight, 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 same kind of stuff that happened to Obama when he ran. You know that he because he was linked to errors and all those folks. Um, you know, just just one after another, just uh, the the connecting the dots that don't actually have connections, but you can connect them right yourself, and people will believe it if you just keep saying it. Because like we've said before, no one's checking the house, right? No one, none of these news news outlets are really calling these folks out for what they're doing, right? They're just allowed to just spread alternative facts over and over and over again. And eventually people, like Hitler said, the, the lie is big enough, people will believe it. If you keep saying it and no one's there to refute it, people will believe it. Someone will believe it, right? Not everyone, but someone will. Enough people to cause a problem like January 6th. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so. we got our last story on uh, the down ballot watch here. And then, we, of course, we have and another thing, which is uh, not actually an uplifting story this week. Yeah. Yikes. Well, speaking of speaking of candidates getting booted off the ballot, apparently there's some shit going down in Oakland. The city clerk gave out some erroneous information, and now they're saying that they can't be held responsible for it. Good evening. Three months until election night, but there's already major problems in Oakland. Yeah, major mayoral problems. The city clerk's office made a mistake resulting in the disqualification of several mayoral candidates. So now what happens? Tonight, some of those disqualified candidates are speaking out. We bring in NBC Bay Area's Audrey Assistio. Well, as you can imagine, those mayoral candidates are frustrated and angry tonight, but they're not giving up without a fight. The city clerk's office of Oakland admits it's made a huge clerical mistake, but says, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it now. Oakland teacher Manisha M.J. Carter is one of the three mayoral hopefuls now off the ballot because of that mistake. I love Oakland. I, you know, nothing's going to change that, but it, it has hurt. It's hurt here. Here's what happened. Mayoral candidates were told August 17th was the deadline to submit their paperwork and get on the ballot. It's also printed in the 2022 candidates handbook. August 17th is the filing deadline for all offices without an incumbent running. Mayor Libby Schaff isn't running for another term. So come August 12th, well before that August 17th deadline, candidate Manisha MJ Carter says she was caught off guard when she was contacted by the city clerk's office saying her paperwork needed to be filed by the end of that day. That's five days earlier than what her campaign team had planned. They scrambled. They weren't ready yet. There was so much preparation involved to get to the point where I get an email that my signatures are insufficient because I had to uh, only submit 52 signatures. Um, I just feel like I was not given an opportunity to get 100 signatures or more. The city clerk's office has caused a massive upheaval in fair elections and democracy in our city. ACLU attorney Elisa Victory Villanueva is now also off the ballot. She has since filed an elections complaint with the Secretary of State's office seeking a review. The city clerk's office released a statement saying in part, quote, while we regret the confusion this has caused, the candidate filing deadline in question is prescribed by the California State Elections Code. Neither the city clerk nor any other city official has discretion to alter or waive state elections law, including authority to extend the filing deadline. Derek Sue is the third candidate who didn't make the ballot. Meanwhile, a total of nine candidates have qualified to run for Oakland mayor this fall. In the newsroom, Audrey Assistio, NBC Bay Area News. Oh, they could do something about this. So, yeah, so much to unpack here. The first and foremost thing is like, why is this so hard to solve, right? Like, you made a mistake. You admitted you made a mistake. I understand the state law supersedes it. There's no, there's nothing that prohibits you from figuring this out and getting these people on the ballot there really isn't i don't uh, i don't see the state coming after them for allowing no, no certainly not and if even if anything like you know talk to our their state representatives from oakland and make sure that they don't come after the city right like they can figure this out um and yeah the clerk screwed up massively uh, this is not uncommon with registrars city clerks this has happened quite a bit in fact um there's all, all, all oftentimes conflicting information in candidate packets candidates um, don't really get 
a lot of assistance and support and information. And a lot of it's pretty complicated in terms of what they need to file, when they need to file it. And it's true. So in a, in a typical race, if the incumbent does not file to run, right, uh, candidates will have another five days, usually after five business days or so after the filing deadline to file. Uh, and to file for the race. The theory being that if you have an incumbent who's running, their pretty st- incumbency is very strong, right? And you don't necessarily want to jump into a race against an incumbent and spend all that money and all those resources and do all that work, right? And waste the time running against the incumbent. So they give you the option of, okay, wait and see if the incumbent files. The difference here is that Libby Schaff was termed out. She was like, it wasn't like she was, she was allowed another term. She's not, she can't run. So she's not technically the incumbent even though she's the current mayor, right? So it, it's a semantic thing, but their packet didn't make that clear. And first time candidates aren't going to know any better than that because she's the incumbent, right? For all they know, they don't understand that nuance and they don't, they probably can't afford a high price consultant to tell them that. And even with a high price consultant, I've seen candidates fuck up the fuck these things up. So there's that on top of it. Um, and then beyond that, this has happened in so many ways. Like uh, the city clerk in San Jose has screwed up, you know, uh, signature deadlines and the number of signatures you need for a, for a ballot measure. They've lost signatures. They've told candidates one date they've, they've uh, followed through on another. There was a candidate this year who had this, who failed to file on time because of this rule. However, I will point out that that candidate, it was entirely their fault. Like the, the rules were really clear in the city, in the city of San Jose materials. Um, but this did happen before. It's happened to me as a consultant and a, and a, a campaign hack in the past. The clerk has given us erroneous information and they say, well, we're not your attorney. We're not here to, you know, we, we can't be held legally responsible for the information we give you. If it's inaccurate, you, det- you know, you relied on our information, but you knew it wasn't, you know, necessarily accurate. And if you really wanted to be sure you'd hire a lawyer and, you know, read it through yourself and you do this at your own risk. Um, and that's just to me, complete bullshit you know if, if, if you're if this is about public service and you're asking people to run and you're encouraging people to get engaged and to to seek office and to represent their community you need to make it easier on them you need to make the filing fees you need to make it abundantly clear what they're doing and how they do it you need to have people assigned to these candidates to help them through the process like con, uh, con, public consultants um, unless they decline them, we need to do more to encourage candidates to run, right. And pay, pay elected officials better, frankly, right. A lot of these things would help attract better people to public service. We lament the dumbasses and the lowest common denominator that we end up having to vote for and elect to public office. We never spend enough time thinking about, well, what encourages someone to run? Who are we encouraging to run? How are we encouraging them to run? How can we get more people, not this like Louis, uh, Linda Louie person or whoever, or these other yahoos that run, but how can we get legitimately good people like producer Dave to run for public office? Nope. Right? Nope. <laughs> um, but you know, but you know what I'm saying though, right? Like this, does that make sense? Yeah. And I mean, like, I mean, not for nothing, I guess. And this would just be my advice based on other situations we've seen. If you are running for public office, try to beat those deadlines by as many days as you can, 100%. just in case something comes up. But that doesn't mean it should be incumbent upon you to be beating these deadlines. If the deadline, if you're told this is the deadline and you meet the deadline, you've met the deadline. So correct. That's right. you can't move the goalpost at the last minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel I feel sorry for those people that are trying to run because they were, you know, they weren't names I'm familiar with. They probably running on a shoestring, and now they spent all correct. that money trying to run, and it was all for nothing. Correct. So, Oftentimes the best candidates are running on shoestring budgets, grassroots campaigns. That's the first time they've run for anything and they don't have the resources to hire high price consultants or even low price consultants like me. Right. They, they don't have, uh, they have their mom helping them or their, their son or their daughter is their treasure campaign treasurer. Right. Like, or their CPA is their treasurer. Right. They don't have those kind of resources to expect them to is ridiculous. They should figure something out, get these, let these people run. They're not going to win. None of these people, are gonna, although that one gal who, whose name is victory, what a great, what a great name. Um, she apparently was able to, she petitioned, she was able to get back on the ballot. So for whatever Good. reason, she's back on. I don't know about the other two, but she obviously can afford to have some friends come in and help her. She probably has an ACLU attorney who can help her out. Other people don't have that kind of resource. So we need to make it easier for folks to run, not harder. Um, it's, it's traumatizing enough running for office, let alone all the work you have to go through just to get on the ballot in the first place that that's true so we're going to move on to end another thing here we usually have like a public interest story an animal interest story something nice something fun something cool not this not this week at all no suspicious death where a woman's body was found inside of a home yesterday morning ktbu's amanda quintana is there at the scene and the police believe the woman's daughter actually lived with the body for more than a year good morning amanda 
Yeah, that's right. Good morning. Police originally came to this house here on Windsor Drive for a welfare check. I will show you that it's this house that you could see the light lit up right oh in the God, it looks like the psycho it's house. One of four houses here in a cul-de-sac. Police got a report that there were 20 to 30 packages on the porch, and the woman who lives here had not been seen for several weeks. When police could not contact her either, they entered the home to find a woman dead in the living room. Now, based on the decomposition position of the body, investigators believe she was dead for more than a year. There was also another woman living there who said she was the deceased woman's daughter. She said her mother died of natural causes back in April of 2021. Police say based on her condition, the daughter was taken to the hospital. Yesterday, yeah. investigators gathered evidence here and they declared this home uninhabitable. They put red tags on this home. They say they are still collecting more information about this. They also have not yet released the identity of that woman who died, but they will still be investigating here, calling this a suspicious death. Mm -hmm. Live in Petaluma, Amanda Quintana, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Um, I got enough sus. You think it's a little sus? <laughs> the whole oh, wow. <clears throat> We're probably never going to hear anything about this again because it was in Petaluma. But yeah, um, of course, yikes! Just fucking yikes! Yeah, the, the hoard the hoarding just unbelievable. Uh, it takes on new, new, <laughs> new levels. Um, well, oh, hang on one second. I think there's someone at our door, or maybe not. Anyway, um, well, it was wonderful seeing you again, producer Dave, for another fantastic episode of Down Ballot. Yep, I'm so glad that I'm so glad that Bad Baby is still sleeping, slumbering in my. <laughs> slept the Very whole show. Nice. Very slept nice. The whole show. Your um, your your room with a baby was far less chaotic than my uh, my studio with uh, with doggos and people arriving for local love. <laughs> so for a change, I'm going to read this show out. Everybody, thanks for listening to Down Ballot. We're live every Tuesday, 7:30 p.m. Pacific on Twitch. Make sure you check out our brand new swag shop. It's powered by Fourth Wall. Changing swag shops was a pain in the ass, but this the stuff they're offering is pretty great. Um, by next week, you'll be able to gift people in our chat an item from the swag shop the same way you can gift a subscription to our channel. Um, <clears throat> Twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. This is Locals by Audible Smoke. And uh, stay tuned. We have, if you're listening live, stay tuned. We have Drawing Heaven in the studio for an interview. Thanks, Councilman. Peace out. <laughs> To get the party started Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing green Sit with the front of the stage waiting for FTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing We now get the fuck up on stage and rock the scene, yeah. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we wanna do, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car to smoke another one what? and another one. Woo! Now, just when the magic starts kicking in, I hear we left playing, and you know it's time to head in. All right, everybody, now it's time to grab a new drink, spark it if you got it, and then pass it to me. Yeah. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. Last up on the bill for the show tonight is down and dirty and five so we
hit it outside To spark up another joint Now who's got my lighter? Stoner E, of course Shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch Being who I gotta be I'm fucked up like the US economy The truth is is that I don't think logically Stoner E, take you on a psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me And outside shit we smoke a lot of broccoli Rocky the rolly, all that sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck, but I'll probably do it sloppily We do what we want, what we wanna do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Dance with the band and enjoy the band We do what we want, what we wanna do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Sunday, 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 right here on twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. It's the Plex, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific and on into red light. We have the worst news in the week that no one else will cover. The Plex has it all. Conspiracy, right-wing nut jobs, Christian extremism, and Madison Star Moon. Tune in every Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media and find our full schedule at Echoplex Media dot com.